start the, by just uh, welcoming everybody and giving you a round good morning. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual event today. We have an exciting program featuring WW International Chief Executive Officer Mindy Grossman and Consumer Technology Association President and Chief Executive Officer Gary Shapiro. As we get underway with our program this morning, I have just a few housekeeping matters uh, to cover. First, everybody's been muted, so if you're looking to unmute yourself, you can't. Uh, secondly, uh, during the question and answer portion of today's session, please use your Q&A button to submit any questions for the speakers. You can find your Q&A button in the middle of the bottom bar of your screen. Next, this Masters in Leadership series is made possible by our co-producer, Consumer Technology Association, and the following sponsors. Our premier sponsors, CoreSight and SAP. Our support sponsors, American Systems, Amazon Web Services, CGI Federal, CNSI, Cressa, Iridium, Micron Technology, Morgan Stanley, NTT Data, Raymond James and Associates, Transformation Systems Inc. and Verite Group, or otherwise known as VGI. Thank you all for your support. Now it's my incredible privilege to introduce today's moderator, Gary Shapiro. Gary is a proud NVTC board member and president and CEO of, of Consumer Technology Association, the US Trade Association representing more than 2,200 consumer technology companies and which owns and produces CES, the global stage for innovation, and this year intends to be the, vir the best virtual show on the planet. We look forward to seeing you, Gary, as you host that event. It is through his New York Times best-selling books, television appearances, and as a columnist whose more than 1,000 opinion pieces have appeared in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others, Gary has developed direct policymakers and business leaders on the, on the importance of innovation in the U.S. economy. A thought leader, Gary is an influencer on LinkedIn and has more than 300,000 followers. Please join me in welcoming Gary Shapiro. Thank you so much, Greg, for that generous introduction and for your leadership of the NVTC. And thanks to the NVTC team who worked uh, so hard to develop these series of of talks and to make them successful, sitting side by side with the great CTA team. So thanks to both of you. You know, for over 38 years, uh, Mindy Grossman has built and transformed consumer brands. She's a self-proclaimed accidental CEO, and we'll hear more about that soon. In July of 2017, Mindy joined WW, which is formerly called Weight Watchers, as its president and CEO. In her very first year at WW, the company saw an increase of some 1 million members and has since reached a record high member retention rate of over 10 months. Prior to joining WW, Mindy served as CEO of HSNI, Home Shopping Networks, uh, and as a member of the company's board from 20, 2008 to 2017, where she oversaw a $4 billion direct-to-consumer retail portfolio. She successfully took the company public in 2008 and subsequently became the CEO, CEO of HSNI. She served as Global Vice President in Nike, where she oversaw its $4 billion apparel business. And she has led the development and growth of the global women's business and served as co-chair of the Nike's Women's Leadership Council. She has received so many uh, recognitions, just a few. MM&M and PR Week's Top 50 Health Influencer, uh, just in 2019. Time Magazine's 50 Most Influential People in Healthcare, 2018. Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business. Fortune's Business Person of the Year, 2014. What an honor. Forbes Magazine, the 100 Most Powerful Women in Several Years. Financial Times, uh, also several recognitions, top 50 women in world business, and Corporate Innovator of the Year, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. She still sits as Vice Chairman and a member of the Board of Directors of UNICEF, and she is a member of the Board of Directors of Fanatics. So welcome, Mindy Grossman, to this great one-on-one -on -one opportunity. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. 
So could you start us on just tell it? I mean, I, I gave some of the highlights, but how did you get involved in this, uh, this world? Like, t tell us where you grew up, your background, your, your unique journey. Yeah, I had a, a very unconventional journey to where I am today. I was adopted at a very young age. Um, and, you know, my mom and dad, my mom wasn't able to finish high school because she had a sick parent. My dad finished high school and then went into the Air Force. And they tried for 12 years to have a child. My father worked nights in the produce business. Um, and one night, his boss, who really took pity on him for the journey they were going through to no avail, and handed him a check to adopt a child, and I'm the child. And what I remember from a very young age my parents telling me I could do and be whatever I wanted and nothing could get in my way if that's what it really was meaningful, but make it meaningful. So I was very serious as a child growing up because I felt that if I'd been given this gift, I needed to use it wisely. So I finished high school at 16, went right into college, was very set on being a lawyer and then a judge. Uh, I got engaged to be married when I was 19 to my high school sweetheart, and the whole path was laid out. However, there I was getting ready to go into my last semester of college as an English literature and philosophy major. Um, and I woke up one day and said, this is not the course of my life. This is not what meaning is going to be. So imagine the phone call to my stereotypical Jewish parents when I called and said, um, I'm not going to law school in the fall. Uh, I'm breaking my engagement. I'm not getting married. And I'm leaving now and moving to New York to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And in 1977, I showed up with some savings and a couple of suitcases in New York City and said, I have a vision of wanting to be in a business that's creative, but I may not necessarily be the creator, but I wanna be in the business of making creativity successful. And I started looking for a role in either the media industry or the fashion industry. And I was offered uh, a role as the assistant to the president of the international business of a company called Manhattan Industries. And I remember in that interview, going through the whole interview, and finally I was asked if I took shorthand. I said, no, but I take fast longhand. And it was when I realized that ingenuity can sometimes pay off, and I was hired. And I ended up spending the first about 15 years of my career in the menswear industry, working for companies like Morona Sport, Jeffrey Banks, Tommy Hilfiger. Um, then I became president of Chaps Ralph Lauren, um, then I was head of new business development for Ralph, where I worked on the business plan for Polo Jeans Company and uh, found the partner to do it with. And then the company asked me to be the CEO, uh, which I was able to build the company from zero to 450 million in about three and a half to four years. And we were planning to potentially go public and Jones New York came in with an offer for the company, which they accepted. I stayed for a year and realized that the culture was not for me. And you'll hear more about my perspective on culture later. And I got a call from a gentleman named Phil Knight. And he had just come back into the company to build a new leadership team. And I was the first person to ever run their global apparel business who actually came from the apparel business. Normally, we're out of the footwear business. Um, and I felt this was a huge opportunity for me to get the equivalent of an MBA in marketing along with running a global uh, business. Um, but I actually turned the job down at first because I couldn't move my family to Oregon for a number of reasons. And Phil called back and said, can we make it work? So somehow for six years, I commuted between New York and Portland, Oregon, and I, I have a daughter um, and a very supportive husband who deals with my uh, insanity at times. Uh, and I, I was at the company for six years. I also led their first women's leadership um, group, as you mentioned. I was very focused on 
diversity and inclusion, which has been a core passion and pillar for me that whole time. But after six years, it was becoming a lot with the commute and they just put in a new CEO, Mark Parker. And I realized that I was ready for the next thing. But after having such an incredible experience, where do you go from there? And interestingly enough, I was um, introduced to Barry Diller, who at the time had a retail portfolio called IAC Retail that was comprised of Home Shopping Network and a whole group of catalogs, so all direct to consumer. And I said, I'd love to meet Barry, but let me think of what I might do with this business. And I literally had an epiphany while I was, I had never heard of HSN or QVC. It was just not in my wheelhouse. Um, but I was a fan of things like Food Network and HGTV. And I knew the world was changing. Mobility and direct to consumer was going to be the future. Um, I knew that people's spending and buying habits were changing and brands were becoming distribution captive. So I had this vision to transform the business into an editorial commerce experience with entertainment, just like Food Network, DIY, Style, HGTV. I pitched Barry, he said yes, and I made the decision. And when I made the decision to go from Nike to IAC Retail, people thought I'd literally had a midlife crisis. Like how could I go from the most incredible brand in the world to a, a dated, not performing business? But I think that's what transformation is, being able to see what the future is. And it was an example of leading a company through both a brand and a digital transformation. So I joined the company in 2006. Um, we relaunched the brand in 2007 and it took off. And then in 2008, um, at the probably the worst time you can imagine, in August 2008, I took the company public, uh, first time public company CEO, brand new board, two weeks before a complete economic crisis. So um, certainly the learnings from, from then uh, are, are valuable now more than ever. But we really uh, actually leaned in and the board supported and we invested in innovation. And yes, we had to make some hard decisions, but HSN actually grew in 2008 and 2009. And it was because of that, that we were able, and you find companies that use the opportunity to think about what they want to look like coming out of this are the ones that succeed. Uh, and I was there for almost 10 years. And uh, we were putting in a new CEO and I was potentially going to become uh, chairman, but I knew I wanted to do one more thing. But I knew it wasn't in fashion and I knew it wasn't in retail. And I promised myself that if I was gonna do that one more thing, I wanted to deliver both a financial return and a human return on equity. And I got very, very interested in the health and wellness space. Um, you know, I felt that's where consumer tailwinds were really going and there was going to be a lot of opportunity, particularly with technology evolution. Um, and uh, I started really looking at, at brands and I love legacy brands. I love transformation and I love brands that have had an impact on building community. Um, and so uh, once again, when you know it was announced that I was leaving HSNI and going to Weight Watchers at the time, um, there were a lot of people that were surprised. But at that point in my career, they were like, "Okay, let's see what she's going to do and what that transformation was going to look like." So that that's a great story, which leads me to the question: In 2018, Weight Watchers actually became WW. Uh, which previously been known for like major battles and wars and things like that, or George W. Bush, just the, what, what, um, what was the thinking behind it? And is it achieving the objectives that were laid out for that? Yeah, it was very important. You know, people, I think transformation is one of the most overused words in business today. I mean, true transformation is large scale wholesale change, right? 
And you have to start with what are the core values and what are you looking to become? And I had done a lot of work before I joined the company and I actually wrote a four page manifesto to the board before I joined on what I saw was the opportunity, the avenues of business that we could go into and how could we really transform and accelerate growth. And I think if you really want true transformation, there's a number of things that you have to have. You have to have the support and alignment of your board. You have to have investment dollars. You have to have an engaged, passionate culture, and you have to have resilience because it is not going to happen overnight. So I joined the company and quickly realized that if we were going to achieve this vision of going from this legacy 57-year-old company that was all about the science behind healthy weight loss and community, but expand it to be so much more around all of the pillars of wellness and long-term sustainable behavior change, we were gonna to have to really redefine everything from our purpose to our tenants to our brand. And so we pulled a team together and we created what is called our impact manifesto, the impact we wanna have on the world. Um, and as part of building that, we really had to go deep inside and go, what do we now represent? And in today's culture, being defined as a diet or being defined wholly around weight is not relevant, particularly to a new audience. Now, it doesn't mean people don't want to lose weight. In the United States, 72% of the adult population is either overweight or obese, and it's a crisis. And it's even a bigger crisis today because, as you know, the number one factor in COVID deaths was obesity. But if we were going to truly be around sustainable, healthy living behavior change for life, um, we were going to have to rethink everything about our brand. And so in addition to the Impact Manifesto, we did a tremendous amount of work on how we really needed to show up. And this idea that WW, with the tagline, Wellness That Works, we wanted to truly become the mark of excellence around healthy for you. Um, but it was a massive undertaking. The brand had really not been invested in for many years. Anecdotally, to give you an idea of our branded workshops in the US, we had 15 different logos. Um, what did the brand stand for? Um, we had products that didn't live up to healthy living. We actually reformulated and repackaged every single food product we made around the world. You don't eat WW food, but we make snacks and we make things because they had artificial ingredients, sweeteners, preservatives. Um, and it was a big undertaking and we had to get out of that volume to be able to relaunch it. But that's what I meant by transformation being, you've got to make the trade-offs and you have to have the brand. We also reorganized the company as a matrix organization. We're in 12 countries today, but we needed to set ourselves up for future expansion. Um, and so we relaunched uh, the brand in 2019. I would say that our brand perception, which we measure consistently um, around the world, is really at an all-time high of being more associated with a healthy living brand. Now, we will never, ever forego our leadership globally as the number one healthy weight loss brand backed by science and built on community. But today, we've built out the pillars of nutrition, activity, mindset, motivation, community, sleep, hydration. So it really is an entire ecosystem of support. That's a great story. So how will you measure the success in a, in a few years? What, what, what are you looking at by, I hate to say it, but numbers? So I, I got asked, you know, what would success look like in five years? And I said, what success would look like in five years is to be able, along with partners, be able to stand in front of the world and announce that we together through the work that we've done have changed the health trajectory of the world. 
Now, I know that sounds big, audacious goal and vision, but that's really what it is. We are getting unhealthier as a society uh, every year. And, you know, it's, it's really a concern, particularly when you look at what's happening with youth, what's happening with disparity of health. And our feeling is if that's our goal, the business metrics will be there because we will be touching that many more people with our brand and with our business. Now, in terms of the metrics we pay a tremendous amount of attention to is our subscriber base, our member base. Uh, and we just ended Q2 with an all-time high of 5 million. The second thing we look at is our retention, which is at a high of over 10 months. But I've been quoted as saying, I want to start seeing retention in years, not months. That's the goal. But what I really also measure is engagement. And are, do we not just have the members, but are the members engaging on a consistent and ongoing basis because the more engaged they are, the greater success they will have. And that's really been our focus. That's great. Um, you are very well known for your, your business uh, competence, your success, the, the various things you are. I just couldn't help but think this is a good time to be in Weight Watcher, WW rather than in a, apparel, especially for the men's apparel, because it doesn't seem to be a lot of it moving the last few months. But one of the, your, your partners in success has been Oprah Winfrey. And I, I couldn't help but notice she's a major owner of the company. Well, a, one of the many, probably the largest individual owner, I would guess. Um, can you tell us about your experience in working with her in your 2020 vision tour? And some of the guests that you've had in that that made the greatest impact with their story of wellness? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that was really important to me prior to joining the company, because I had seen that she had partnered with the company, um, taking a 10% ownership of the company and also joining the board, as well as being able to be front and center of kind of talking about what we do. And so I went to California and I spent a day with her because I really wanted to understand why she made that choice. And if you know anything about Oprah, she's one of the most purposeful human beings in the world. And if she commits to something, there's a real reason behind it. And she says, says no a lot more than she says yes. She's infinitely purposeful. And we were very aligned on what we saw and what this company had done and the fact that it had been transforming lives for over 50 years, but now the opportunity was so much greater. And her superpower, her superpower is really to motivate people to think about what is it going to take for them to live the best life they can? That was the Oprah Winfrey show for many, many years. And about two years after I'd, I'd been at the, at the company, after we rebranded, after we built, et cetera, about a year and a half, um, she called me and said, I'm ready. I said, okay. She said, I'm ready to use my superpower. And we had always talked to be, about being able to take this and really galvanize large audiences around immersing them in an experience that ultimately would end up giving them the ability for themselves to take a different path to live the best life. And so we built a team and we launched in January of this year uh, WW presents Oprah's 2020 vision, your life and focus, nine city arena tour, 135,000 people completely sold out. And as we sit here today on Zoom, I, I look back and I think that March 7th at the finale in Denver, I was so excited to be with 15,000 people in an arena. But it was a full day experience from eight in the morning till three or four in the afternoon of really an entire assessment of your life. And at each stop, we had motivators and then she would have a one-on-one -on -one sit down with someone about this idea of 
living your best life and transformation and what you can do. So we had everyone from Dwayne The Rock Johnson to Michelle Obama, Jennifer Lopez, um, Kate Hudson, uh, just an incredible uh, group of individuals. And then the finale, for the first time, um, Oprah actually interviewed Gail King versus the other way around, which was also incredibly powerful. Um, but there were daybreaker dance segments, there were uh, meditations, and you really, really saw people leave having been so affected in a positive way. So when COVID hit, we also knew and she knew that people were going to need motivation, support, and inspiration more than ever before. And we actually launched within two weeks, a four week virtual tour, which we made available for free to everyone around the world, because this is when people needed it the most. And they were two hour sessions each, every Saturday on a different theme. Um, and again, we had different experts. So the second theme was around connection and relationship. And we had Dr. Esther Perel, who's done TED Talks and talked about how do you live in this environment um, or connectivity, et cetera. And we ended up having three and a half million people um, really come in to have this experience. And I think for us, it really is important. We're a very purpose-driven organization. And our feeling is the more we can impact people's lives, and it goes back to my initial conversation. You know, if I can have the human impact, we will be able to have the business impact. Wow, that's quite amazing. Your timing sounds like it was really good for that tour. Sometimes luck does triumph. I, I have to say, we shake our head all the time. Yeah, I was, I was saying that about CES until a couple months ago as well, because we got our <laughs> January CES in in Las Vegas, just not the next one in Las Vegas. But we will be digital. We'll try to do half the job, the good job as you did. Um, so let's talk about COVID and the response and what happened. Um, you certainly had an amazing acceleration of digital members signing up in the pandemic. You mentioned 5 million subscribers, which is up almost 10% from last year. Um, what kind of different support did they need and how did you meet the requests? Yeah, it's really interesting. As I mentioned, March 7th was the finale of the tour. I flew back to New York uh, March 8th. By Wednesday, we had made the decision for the safety and security of our uh, members and of our employees to uh, close our office and as well to pause all our physical workshops. Just to give you order of magnitude, we had 30,000 physical workshops a week. And at the same time that we made that decision, given all the investments we made over the past number of years in product and technology, we pivoted our entire team and said, build the virtual solution. And we'd been doing work um, towards that, but now we needed to do it that much more quickly. And in six days, we trained 15,000 coaches and guides, and we launched virtual workshops simultaneously in 12 countries. And the first week, we had 15,000 virtual workshops through Zoom, through scheduling, through Find a Workshop. And the reason we were able to do that is yes, we were focused on the safety and security but we were also maniacally focused in the fact that our members were going to need the support of their coach and their community more than ever. And we had that purpose in mind. And we are still hosting virtual workshops to this day. And that is the reason that our retention continues to be at an all time high. Now, clearly, we weren't signing a lot of studio workshop members because we had been closed, but we saw a very rapid acceleration of our digital signups um, and continue to see that today. And in terms of behavior, 
we can see behavior in real time. Um, we have five million members and we see what they're eating, what they're tracking, how they're working out, what they're talking about within their connect groups and platforms, which we formed. Um, and the one thing that we absolutely see is there has been a large scale reappraisal of how people live, work, spend, but more important, what health and wellness means to them. And as I like to say, wellness is truly going to go from being what was considered a luxury to a necessity as people realize just the fragility of life and what they need to do to get healthy. And that's what we've really been trying to support uh, our members and our community in doing. So for the 5 million, um, is that in a sense, enhanced desire or a new desire, is that translating to actual results as you, as perhaps they would measure them? I'm not talking about financial. Yeah, so, talking so about, what are, we're are they seeing, losing the weight they want and getting the healthier yeah. lifestyles? What, what we are seeing is uh, a definitive increase in engagement year on year. Now, a lot of that is what we've integrated into our app, which is very comprehensive. So for example, um, in nutrition, we have personalized meal planning. You know, when we entered this year, we had just launched MyWW, which is the most personalized and customized program the company ever had. You take an assessment, you're matched to a plan for you. And that idea of personalization has been very uh, important. Um, and to your earlier point, we entered the year with the greatest momentum that we've ever had in the history of, of, of the brand. Um, and, you know, we obviously have had um, some short term, you know, changes to that, but we're starting to see acceleration again. Um, and we also integrated into our activity uh, app. We now have Active, which is audio fitness, and we have Fit On, which is video fitness. And with everybody at home, that was a huge asset. And they can integrate Fit On and immediately get their fit points, which marries up to our loyalty program. We launched sleep tracking, um, and you can sync that up with any of your wearable devices because we knew how much sleep and stress were a factor. We launched hydration. Um, we had mindset and mindfulness with the integration of Headspace. Um, and then we hear through Connect, which is our social network within the app with very, very high engagement. And the community aspect of support and what people want today is more important than ever, even if it's their virtual communities. Um, they want that connectivity. And when a new member starts and comes in to connect, it is the most positive platform you've ever seen. They are immediately embraced and they know, so the honesty and what the conversations people can have is like nothing I've seen before on, on any platform. And that, that's been a big key to what's keeping people engaged and keeping people longer. Hmm. So you have, this is a tech audience that's listening. Um, how does, do you partner with tech companies? Are you looking for, is there a technology you're looking for that would help you in your mission and your company that has not yet been invented or? Is there anything out there that you'd like to see? Yeah, you know, actually over the past, let's call it five years, um, we've made uh, a number of, you know, acquisitions. So for example, one of our prior acquisitions actually became that Connect community platform. Another acquisition became the fitness-based platform. So we're constantly, look, we're constantly investing in our technology and product platforms. We recently built a tech hub, a third tech hub. We have New York, San Francisco. We built our third tech hub in Toronto. And that tech hub is supporting our B2B, B2B2C, our health solutions business, because we built a whole new infrastructure and platform to be able to support employers, providers, payers, physicians, to be able to have us reach new audience, um, which is a very important element today, particularly as 
telehealth and everything uh, is really the, the future. Um, so, but in addition to building our own uh, infrastructure, we have made our acquisitions and we have had partnerships like what I mentioned with FITOM, which we're now launching globally around the world. So it's a, it's a combination. Um, and I think people have to be open today to what do you build yourself, what do you partner, and what do you acquire to give yourself capabilities. Absolutely. We have a parallel set of investments that we're making in going across the industry and defining what sleep is. So it goes across platforms, defining all sorts of aspects of heart monitoring, or even brain waves, and also, believe it or not, of sleep, because different devices in the past have measured sleep differently, and there's a desire to have a consistent measurement across platforms so consumers can really compare platforms and understand that the data is comparable. Or even step, we did step measurement early on as well, because we're very engaged in that. That's a very fast growing area. And also you, you mentioned the concept of uh, telemedicine, which is absolutely huge and is shifted in the last five months quicker than anyone expected, I think. To yeah, what, one of the uh, areas we're also investing heavily in um, is our coaching platforms. And we have a new membership vertical that was um, in development prior to COVID ever happening. And it's virtual coach-led communities, um, very geared to a younger audience, where we've got a new generation of coaches, content becoming very important in terms of engagement to be able to build community in a virtual setting. It's very different than just moving your workshop virtual, which some people want, but this is built for a whole new experience and having this new coaching platform um, where they can really engage with their communities and their members is gonna be very exciting for us as we launch it towards the end of this year. But that required, as you can imagine, uh, also a big investment in both the technology and the product capabilities. Yeah, I mean, it's occurring to me now that the COVID actually has had a little, that cloud has had a little bit of a silver lining for your company and that you've had tens of thousands of gyms that closed. It's almost impossible to buy a gym equipment now um, in, at retail or anywhere without a several month wait, uh, whether it's barbells or work. Uh, well, you know, it, go, it, go, it goes back to what I mentioned when I talked about 2008. And, you, you know, I, I've always been quoted as never waste a good crisis, right? How do you use it to reimagine, accelerate and reinvent? And there's no question that this has really not only allowed us, but it has energized us to accelerate our digital transformation. Now, as part of that, um, we've had to rationalize our real estate footprint um, and really look at what the future is going to be. Um, and we want to meet people where they are and give people the experience they want. So face-to-face -face experience will be a part of what we do. It will be a smaller part of what we do. Um, we just started opening our branded studios uh, in the US. Um, and you know we've been energized by the fact people really do want to bring their community together, but given the environment, that's a relatively slower build, um, but with a big focus on the digital transformation. And, just the fact that we were able to launch those virtual workshops in six days um, and accelerate kind of all the integrations into our app. Now to do that, we had to focus, right? The organization, the teams on what was truly gonna be the most important. And you know, my role, as I like to say, is I'm not just the CEO. I'm the chief communication officer, the chief crisis officer, and the chief hope officer. So I communicate kind of where we are, what our focus needs to be, why we are gonna come out of this a stronger, even more innovative company that can help that many more people lead healthier lives. And you know, it goes back to what's really 
happened is this reassessment of just how important uh, it is to have people take a better sense of what health means to them. And we want to be that 24 seven partner for life uh, for people to realize that vision. It's a, it's a big vision. But when the six day pivot, I mean, how does that work? You're a strong leader. Do you say, I have a great idea. Do you confer with your top people? Do you talk to your board? Where do you draw the line between your ideas and leadership and you saying, look, we got to act quickly. There may be disagreements. How do you manage all the different, in a sense, constituencies that you have to deal with, including your own customers who may not be ready for that type yeah, of Yeah, I have, I have a, a, a perspective on leadership. Actually, there's, there, there's a book that's very aligned with that that Keith Ferrazzi just published called Leading Without Authority. And I think in today's world, it's not autocratic in any way. You really have to be able to use the talent and empower the team and make sure you're surrounded with the right people. And we all came together and really worked through how we were going to move forward, what the priorities were going to be. And I said, the worst thing I could ever hear in the hallway is Mindy said, I never want to hear that, right? It's how are we all aligned how are we communicating the same message? And most importantly, how are we empowering people to act and do their roles? And I think that's you know, a major criteria of leadership um, today. I think it's, it's, it's very important. Do you let people fail? Look, if you don't have failures, you really haven't innovated enough and you're not trying enough. Now, I'm, I believe that risk-taking and boldness are the essence of transformation. But I also say there's a difference between risk and suicide, right? You have to really do the work and use data and use qual and use quant to understand why it is you're building something or doing something in the first place. But the most important thing you need to do in leadership is be able to identify quickly if something's not working, take responsibility, change and move forward. I think the worst thing is thinking it's going to get better or thinking it's going to go away. It's not. Um, and so you have to have the ability to look yourself in the eye and say, you know what, this isn't working, let's pivot. And, you know, the, the other thing that's really important from a leadership perspective is, again, one, one of the greatest assets you could have is acute self-awareness. You know, what is your impact on others? Uh, how are you uh, being perceived? How are you effectively communicating? Um, how are you sensing what's in the room? And another big part of that is, have you surrounded yourself with the right diversity of talent so you can be in a room and have what I call productive discomfort and be able to have the conversations, but then be able to walk out aligned? Wow. You've covered a lot of areas. One of them that keeps hitting me is the, a lot of this is empathy. It's kind of a, a wrapper around that. But you also, there's a tougher part of this as well, is you're affecting people's lives and their livelihoods. And you had to close all the physical studios, which made up about 25% of your business. And how did you do that so quickly? And, and what were your, was your thought process? And how did you effectively communicate it, uh, the new business realities to those employees that stayed and were there or were, knew the others that had to leave? Yeah, you know, it's really hard. And, you know, I take any decision that affects someone's life personally and very seriously. And as a matter of fact, I had said to the board, if I have to make one change because of this, um, I have to put myself in it as well. And, you know, we literally uh, had to relook at what we were going to do. We were paying people for months um, and realized that we just weren't going to have these roles again. And so we did have to make changes in the field and we did have to consolidate um, quite a number of things. And, you know, you work to do it as respectfully as possible and as right as possible. And, you know, most people handle it well. And then, you know, you, you have to understand people when they're in difficult circumstances. But the most important thing to me is 
can, can I live with myself? And do I think that I've done everything possible if I'm going to make those changes? But the thing I also have to think about is the consequences if I don't make the changes. Because in a very big pivot and a very different business model, we have to be able to invest in other areas. And what we have to think about is future growth. Is that the toughest part of the CEO role, is making those type of decisions? I would say if someone said, what is the number one priority being in this role, it's talent. And it's having the right talent at the right time around you. And unfortunately, part of that is making those hard decisions because as the business evolves, your needs evolve in what you have. Um, but you have to be able to have those honest conversations um, and do it as well as you possibly can. But of course, you know, the day, the day I always say to someone, if you don't have those feelings, right, then there's a humanity that's lost in you and you shouldn't be doing it anymore. I, I hear you. And I totally agree with you. It's a, uh, and what you, a lot of what you're saying is very consistent with what the uh, business round table has issued um, a year ago, I think. And, uh, also, uh, Alan of uh, Murray of Fortune Magazine has really emphasized is that the role of a company isn't only to make money, it's, but it's to, there's other constituencies, it's to improve society. Do you agree with that? I, I think it's absolutely critical. And I've done sessions with Alan on this. He's terrific. Yes. Um, and I really do believe that the brands and the businesses of the future that are going to engender the greatest trust with people are the ones who can marry technology plus meaning to have people live better connected lives. And you have to be built on the purpose and the impact, no matter what business you're in, of what you're trying to provide people and give people. And you know, I'm fortunate to be with an organization that has purpose at its core. Um, and that's what motivates you know, all our 15,000 employees around the world every day because they want to impact people's lives. And related to that, I mean, in, in the midst of COVID, we obviously had this uh, focus on racial injustice. And I was wondering, I know that you've been pretty vocal on that and, and acted. Could you share how you've communicated and what you've done? Sure. Um, you know, I have been a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion most of my career. And I think it is a societal imperative, but I also think it's a business imperative if you want to have long-term sustainable success. And, you know, in the, in the few years I've been at the company, um, we had actually made progress, but it became very clear to me that we needed to do more and we needed to accelerate that progress. You know, we, we changed our board fairly dramatically. Uh, we have six men, six women, two black women. Um, our leadership team, uh, my CHRO, uh, Kim Seymour, has been my incredibly valuable partner as we've looked to say, what more can we do as an organization um, and really have diversity and inclusion be at our core? Um, so we quickly did massive listening sessions with our black employees. Um, we really looked at what we could do that was actionable and sustainable long-term as well as measurable. And I think that actionable, sustainable, measurable is very important. So we, we did a number of things. We did make a million dollars in donations to uh, a series of organizations that are really looking to impact Black Lives positively. We named a head of diversity and inclusion in addition um, to having uh, Kim at the helm. We will be spotlighting Black-owned businesses on the WW e-commerce shop. Uh, we've pledged for the CEO action for diversity. Um, we're creating new career opportunities and experiences for our Black employees, and we're requiring best practices diversity across the entire hiring arena, as well as committing not only to our employee diversity, 
but our member diversity. And we had already started with the launch of our 5013C WW Good to help underserved communities get healthier. But what COVID has really uh, brought out is the tremendous disparity of access, particularly to food um, and other areas of health. Uh, so with WW Good, um, we have partnered in every country with different organizations in the US with Feeding America and Wholesome Wave. And we've already raised over $5 million uh, to support uh, giving food and access. But our plans are to really build, just like we have an academic advisory board and a youth and family advisory board, we're working on an advisory board to really look at this health disparity in underserved and black communities. Hmm. Well, it's quite an array of uh, actions, which I think are more important than the words a lot of corporations have issued. Um, I have a lot of audience questions, and I'm going to try to go through some quickly. There's a question about telehealth. You mentioned telehealth. Do you see WW getting more involved in telehealth and possibly offering telehealth type of solutions? Any partnerships there with uh, Teladoc or something like that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, what, what we're really focused on is wholesale behavior change. And what I meant by telehealth. I think people will go maybe see their doctor once a year, but in between, a lot of this is going to be through um, telehealth. And I think the same with our business and why I'm so excited to have this massive coaching platform, because I think we will be able to have diversity of our coaches and be able to communicate with people um, virtually that much more effectively. Now, having said that, we are looking at areas such as diabetes. Um, in our, our B2B business, we do have a pre-diabetes program, um, but how can we continue to integrate uh, effective um, you know, food programs and other areas for certain trickle-down effects of obesity? Hmm. Uh, Kelly Carly asks, can we ask Mindy about the app? It's incredible, all-inclusive. I'm an on, again, off again member since 1999. I rejoined in February of 2020, and it's incredible. That is by Kelly Curley, and it's, I don't know her, so this was Well, welcome it. to the family, and I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably our most consistent user. I think I, uh, I, I got the award for most days tracked in a row. <laughs> Do you want to miss anything else about the app so for those that are not familiar with it? Yeah, so, you know, it's a almost five-star app, and it really is everything about uh, health at your fingertips. So if you think of nutrition, um, the way our program works is you can eat anything you want on WW, but we have one of the largest food databases in the world, and every food is evaluated on calories, fats, sugars, nutrients, and satiety, does it fill you up? And depending on what program you're matched to, you get a certain amount of zero point foods and a certain amount of point values during the day that you can have. And that's how you manage. But now we personalize recipes, personalize content, same thing in fitness, depending on your age, uh, height, weight, gender, et cetera, you're given fit point targets for the week. And now in the app, we have the audio fitness, we have the video fitness and other elements, mindset and motivation, you know, a lot of content, particularly now around stress and uh, how do you bring that down, which is why we integrated Headspace. Um, hydration, a good health measure, sleep, as I mentioned before, and sleep tracking and how you can positively impact your sleep, you know, needs, et cetera. And then Connect, which is the community platform. So it really is the combination of every pillar that you really need of wellness behavior change built on the power of community. That's great. So uh, question, uh, where do you see your role in it? future with health and wellness and with the number of people you can reach do you feel you, you can also remind people to wear masks and <laughs> i just have to throw this question because i want to get it in there 
is you've taken this role relatively recently. You know, you were involved in a totally different worlds. What do you tell your relatives and your friends now um, when you see their behaviors that are you, how do you approach behaviors that you think should change with it? Yeah, I, what, what I think is one of the reasons why I think our program works so well, there's no negative. It really is about inspiring people and giving them the ability to experience joy and have the support. Um, it was funny when I first took the role, um, if, if my friends knew me, they, they would all ask me how many points I was eating and they'd eat the cookie behind my back. And I'm like, you can eat a cookie. Um, or if it was someone that, you know, I didn't know and I got introduced, hi, this is Mindy Grossman. She's the CEO of what used to be Weight Watchers. W. They would look at themselves and I go, look, I'm not here to give you guilt, but I'm here to talk about what long-term sustainable healthy behavior changes and you know in my family alone we're now obsessed ww my husband lost 35 pounds and my daughter after she had her first baby lost a lot of weight and she is now a one-on-one -on -one personal coach uh for ww so we uh we actually live uh the lifestyle and you really realize um, what we see is when one person in the family does the program, in general, the whole family gets healthier because it's totally livable and sustainable and it becomes a way of life. Is the philosophy of the program that me measuring is important or being conscious of everything you're doing? I, it starts with being very conscious and then ultimately it becomes ingrained behavior. And you, you start making unconscious choices because you've been making the conscious choices for so long. And it really becomes, since you can basically eat anything, uh, you just can't eat everything at the same, at the same time. Well, I, I Unfortunately, we have to close off. We have a lot of questions that I didn't get to and a lot of other things. This has been incredible. Great conversation. Amazing. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for your time. You're really terrific. And I, I think it's what you're doing and your, your big mission. You said so many great things like a human return on uh, equity and resilience and culture and how you're changing the world in a healthy way. It's, this is, it's like long overdue. I wish you were a political party because I'd vote for you. <laughs> so thank you very much and thanks to <laughs> Vice you. versa. <laughs> well, thank you, Minnie. I hope to see you so again much, and everyone. talk to you. And thanks, everyone, for sticking around. It's been terrific. And now we go to our voice of God. Uh, thank you very much, Mindy and Gary, for such an insightful discussion. And to all of you, thank you as well for attending today's virtual event. We hope you stay safe and healthy and have a great rest of your day.